website called amigalove.com. It's been up for a few years. Uh, I also just recently launched what is called the Seattle Commodore Computer Club or CCCC or if you're in if you speak Spanish, yes, 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 yes. Um, right now we're only a member of two. We're looking for more. I know. We're looking for more. I see a few people out here. We're actually going to have our second meetup uh, this week in the Fremont neighborhood. And we just pull out our hardware and play games and geek out on stuff like that. That's what it's like. So if you're into that kind of stuff, come talk to me after the, uh, the little demo and the talk. I was going to talk about two topics today. Um, and I might do a break of five minutes in between while I do a little bit of setup stuff. But the first talk is going to be about a, a hardware product from the 1990s called the Rejuvenator. And this is all about the Amiga 1000. So hands up, how many people here have have an Amiga 1000? Okay, quite a few. How many people here have had an Amiga 1000? Nobody else? Okay. So, this was the first Amiga that Commodore put out on the market back in 1985. Um, and so, I had a feeling there were probably going to be a few people in the audience that had never owned one, possibly never even seen one. Um, so, it's worth talking about why this machine is so special, and to keep in the back of our minds the whole way through, because I know there's a lot of Commodore 64 and 128 folk in the house, why this machine was just so shocking at the time uh, with, what it could, with, with what it could do. <clears throat> so, when it was released in the summer of 85, it retailed for 1,300 bucks. Those are basically like today's Apple prices, right? That's $3,000 for a machine was not it was not a Commodore 64, it was not an everyman machine. It was expensive. Um, but it had just absolutely mind-boggling audio and video capabilities that really were about 10 years ahead of its time. There wasn't a single machine, and not a single computer company on the planet that could even come close with this kind of uh, horsepower that was on the retail market. And for the first time, realistically, for consumers, it had this novel idea of multitasking, which I think a lot of people take for granted today. But if, since my kids are here in the front row, they'll understand this. It's basically like if you had an iPad, you would launch an app. If I want to launch another, at least the original software on iPads, if I wanted to launch another app, I would have to close that and open up another one. That's the way software used to work. This would actually allow you to launch some programs that supported it. You could slide it down or pop it into the background and actually have another full-fledged program running at the exact same time. And that just was unheard of at the time. So that was a big deal. And now from like a designery, geeky perspective, I am a designer by trade, and so I kind of focus on the aesthetics sometimes. And this was absolutely the most beautiful Amiga ever made. It has what's lovingly referred to as the garage for your keyboard to slide in and out of. It has the checkmark logo. This is the only Amiga computer that they ever had that on. Um, it has this mouse, which they call the tank, um, that had a mouse connector specifically designed just for this machine. So God forbid this mouse ever break because then you're gonna have to stick one in that just comes straight out and it looks ridiculous, right? Uh, it just had all of these details. On the inside of the case, if you pop the case off, right here, this top shell, if you pop that open, and most people back then in the 80s, they didn't do this for a while, not until they felt like they needed to to like expand the machine or something, but on the inside are the signatures of all the creators, just like they did for the original Mac, including According to Dave Needle, one of the creators, uh, one of the most important creatures, Mitchie, the dog of the founder of Amiga, that paw print is on the inside as well. She helped to uh, tell him when he didn't want, know what to do when he was designing the schematics, he would look at Mitchie and say, should I do this way or that way, rectangular square, and she'd lean one way or the other and say, okay, square. 
So we thank Mitchie for her contribution to Amiga as well. So it has all of these really cool <coughs> visual things, audio things, design-wise, just beautiful. Beautiful machine. Now, it was released a little bit early for financial reasons. And so it has a couple things about it that were kind of sketch when it was put out to the consumer market. It came out with OS 1.1, which was really buggy. Uh, and it didn't last long. In fact, it was so buggy, back in the day, they would put their firmware on chips, right? They would put them on chips, and they put the chips inside the motherboard. So when you flipped it on, like the Commodore 64, just whoop, there it is, it was awesome. Well, this was not quite ready for market, and they knew they couldn't do that because then they'd be requesting customers to pop those chips out and put new chips in later. Well, that, that's not a very feasible strategy. So the, what's called the kickstart, when you first launch the machine, they put it on a floppy disk. So 1.0 was on a floppy, and that was a strategic choice, and actually it was a really good decision by them because soon thereafter, 1.1 was released, then 1.2, and then ultimately, what is considered the definitive version for that Kickstart software, 1.3 came out. And that's the one that most folks these days will want to use if they're using the really old, which I do, um, the really old Kickstarts. Um, it also had 256 kilobytes of RAM. Now that sounds like a lot if you had a Commodore 64, like 256. But it wasn't enough to actually multitask. Once it loads the Kickstart into memory, there's barely enough for it to just do what it needs to do. And so soon thereafter, soon after they released this machine, uh, in some markets they actually had an expansion, 256 additional RAM that went into the front panel right here. But you could also buy that off the shelf at any of these Amiga stores at the time. And so then you had half a meg right there which was enough to do most of everything that you would need to do uh, for that time frame. It also did not have an internal hard drive controller, so everything was floppy based at that point, unless, and I brought some stuff in here as a demonstration, you started to buy peripherals that you would pop onto the side of it. It has an expansion port, and you can start to create this kind of crazy Tetris game of uh, expandable units of RAM, hard drive controllers, all kinds of stuff, clocks. Um, yeah, so the Kickstarter wrong, right? It's kind of funny, but with the Amiga 1000, this lack of a Kickstarter ROM being on a chip and being floppy based, a lot of people in today's times look at that as being a negative. That oh, it's so slow, I have to use floppy disks, all that kind of stuff. However, it actually has the potential to be a pro in some cases, and that's basically what my second talk's gonna be all about, is how you can boot this machine into all kinds of different environments off of a single floppy disk, not two. Um, and it's actually just a lot of fun to kind of muck around with and dink with, but we'll get into that later. So, so I'm giving this little history lesson as to why this, this first talk is about a particular product that makes the 1000 kind of amazing. Um, in 1987, Commodore decided to discontinue the 1000. They put all of their uh, marketing and financial efforts behind two new products, which were the Amiga 500 and the 2000. The 500 was an all-in-one, sort of like the Commodore 64, it was an all-in-one unit, and it was really geared towards the consumer market. It kind of made it a games machine, ultimately. Um, the 2000 was more for professionals people who took the amazing power of the Amiga and really used it for creating graphics, for NTSC slash PAL video, a lot of the broadcast stuff that you saw back at the time, the overlays for the news shows or the weather shows, that was all coming off of Amigas at the time, and that was actually being run for a really long time, well beyond after Commodore had even died, um, just because it was so seamless. Then once we went to LCDs and LEDs and all this other stuff, uh, that was kind of it. So in any case, 1987, they decide to discontinue the 1000. And, you know, that's only two years. And for $3,000, there were a lot of people that were not really ready to let the 1000 go. That's still true. Um, 
They weren't ready to let it go, and some really smart engineers started to come up with plans for how could I, how can I extend the 1000 to still be a viable product along with the 500 and the 2000 and whatever else it is that they decide to make a Commodore. And they started to put their heads together. There was one guy in Australia who, his name is Andrew Wilson. He created, and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this today, but he created uh, what, what is called the Phoenix. The Phoenix was a complete motherboard replacement where you pull all of your chips, well not all of them, but a lot of them. You pull a lot of your original chips out, a couple of them you upgrade from Commodore, you pop them in this new motherboard, and all of a sudden this thing can do anything and everything that all the other Amigas can do. They're extremely rare. Um, so count yourself lucky to be in the presence of one. <laughs> uh, to my knowledge, there's about 200 of these ever made, and you only got the motherboard. Some people would buy them with a hard drive, because this actually can support an internal hard drive as well. And I actually have, not to geek out too much on that right now, but it has a SCSI to SD card in there, and 256 megabytes, but you can go up to four gigs. And, uh, anyway, um, all right. So, but then there was a guy in Dayton, Ohio, we're gonna get into his history now, who came up with this plan called the Rejuvenator, right? The Rejuvenator. I love these names. The Phoenix, the Rejuvenator. It's like, we got a little bit of Greek mythology, we got a little bit of mad scientist going on. I uh, kinda wish he decided to call this the Reanimator, but whatever. Um, this is the guy who created the Rejuvenator. I just wanna give a little history on this guy because I think he absolutely deserves it. Uh, we have some folks in the audience who know about his product and can tell you from their own personal experience that it, when this came out in 1990, he showed it originally at an at Annie Expo, Amiga Expo, in 1990 in New York, when he first showed this, the Amiga community, the Amiga 1000 community, their jaws hit the floor. This was a really, really big deal. Most people never had even heard of this guy. Um, I hope to change that a little bit. In any case, he made this thing totally relevant, this machine totally relevant. Now, this is what an Amiga looks like. An Amiga 1000, she has on no clothes. Mm -hmm. All right. And this thing on top is called the daughter board. And it's a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but there are these all these tiny little golden pins. I haven't counted them, but there's a lot of them. They all map into these little orange Molexes, but basically the daughter board sits right on top if you're in the United States with an NTSC machine. In PAL land, when they started to ship these out, this thing went away. So this won't really be applicable to some folks in Europe. But in any case, here in the United States, we had this, this, this setup. Uh, and this is basically where the RAM was, where the kickstart was getting loaded when you turned the machine on. Okay, so he decided to come up with something that could compete side by side with, at the time, modern technology uh, and try and kick the 1000 a few more years down the road. And this is the Rejuvenator. <coughs> this is what it actually looks like. This is a fully populated board, and to my understanding, a fully working board. I've not actually seated mine in here. Uh, properly yet, it's actually really hard, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but um, basically what happens is, is you take some of the chips from yours, and then you move them up here, all right? I have this backwards. You move them up here, and then you get what's called, bless her heart, there was a, all of the chips in the Amiga were named after women in the office. There's an Agnes, there's a Denise, there's a Paula. Well, Agnes was probably the most important, one of the most important chips on the board. And in the original Amiga 1000, the stock one, right, she was really skinny. She was this thin little thing. As time went on and the Amiga could support more RAM, could support more graphical power, Agnes got bigger and they started to refer to her as Fat Agnes and then eventually obese. Um, as she could get bigger and bigger. And it really won't fit. You can't just take an Agnes and stick her in there. You actually have to have a 
completely separate piece of hardware. And these would have come out of, at the time, Amiga 2000s or 500s, but you could have actually bought them from an Amiga dealer, right? You're not having to strip them out of other machines. And then you do a couple of clips down below, and you've got Kickstart ROM now. You don't need the floppy disk to start up your machine. You flick it on, and if, if there's no hard drive, it's just going to go straight to a workbench request, which is the way the Amiga works. And I'll show that in a little bit. <coughs> so you only need one disk instead of two. It also has, or had, mine's been removed because they have batteries uh, that leak over time. But they also had a, a, a real-time clock, right? Right here. Mine's been popped out of there because uh, the guy that I got it from in Canada, he got it from an old Commodore developer from back in the day, and the battery was actually starting to, to eat up the motherboard, so he snipped it out of there, and I'm fine with that. Oh, that's awesome. So there's the guru meditation. Yeah, so this is because of this little RAM guy that I have stuck in here. We'll mess with that later. There's a, a good friend of mine who actually calls himself the guru of meditation, which is kind of hilarious. Um, yeah, so these boards were made, um, and they're somewhere in the ballpark of 500 of those that were ever made. Potentially, give or take 100. It's probably more on the positive side. There are no records from that era. Uh, and I have talked to these folks. They still, well, so we'll get into that here in just a second. But they're extremely hard to find. Um, they're about as hard to find as the Phoenix. Um, just those people that do have them just don't want to give them away. Right, Matt? Because <laughs> um, they're just pretty special. They turned the Amiga 1000 into a really, really neat machine, even though it is a neat machine already. So this got me and some of my friends to kind of put our heads together um, and come up with this crazy idea. Of, well, why don't we just make these again? Why isn't anybody doing that? We already have a couple of them around. Um, maybe we should try and reverse engineer the thing and just make them again. There's a small but very strong and emotional uh, Omega 1000 community that still exists to this day. Um, not just in the United States, but there's a very strong following in Germany uh, where there was also a Commodore uh, uh, headquarters and manufacturing, and as a result, they actually have, they had a lot of access to some really fantastic hardware over there as well. It's kind of a separate topic, but in any case, started to try and figure out, okay, what, how hard would it be and what would, what would be the process to try and go about this? So I started going through, ultimately, trying to find Greg, because I want to make sure I wasn't going to piss him off. If he's out there, I'm like, I don't want to steal your thunder. This is your idea. There's copyrights involved. I don't even understand how all that works. <coughs> I'm a designer, not a lawyer, as someone on Star Trek might say. <laughs> so uh, I started to just well, do what everyone else would do. I started to use Google. And I started to hunt down, because I did know at least, okay, so the Rejuvenator was created by a company, and it says so on the board, by Expert Services. And it even says so in the manual. But then it says also in the manual that Greg was not actually a member of Expert Services. That's a separate company. For those that aren't familiar with US, and I'm not looking at you, Graham, but for those that aren't familiar with US geography, Ohio is right next door to Kentucky, all right? Expert Services, the company that made this board is from Kentucky. And Greg is from Ohio, right next, right across the river. And so, started to kind of say, all right, let me see if I can find this guy. Well, he was nowhere to be found, right? Nowhere on Twitter, nowhere on LinkedIn, nowhere on Facebook. Couldn't find him on Google. The only things I could find on Google were like these really sketchy listings of people, and you're like, who are those people? They seem to have the same name. Um, but they kind of look like almost white papers, you know, like from the phone book. And it, here's an address, and that seems totally sketchy. I actually started calling those phone numbers. Why not? <laughs> Most of them didn't work. Every now and then I'd get to a voicemail, and it would just go click. They wouldn't even have a, a, a greeting or anything. I'm like, oh, OK, so this is going to sound really weird, but my name's Eric Hill, and I would go on for this like five minute spiel until it would like, cut me off, trying to see if I could find this person. Uh, and then I found a video, uh, a, a really short video, it's only a minute long, it's inside of this hour long video of an Ami Expo in 1990 in New York, 
uh, that an uh, online friend of mine, I'm going to show you this in just a second, actually he had an original video cassette because he had attended the show in 1990. And he had a cassette of it, and he thought, oh, this is hilarious. And so he just decided to digitize it, because he's really into, he's actually a director of photography for film. So, that, I mean, he has all the gear. And he put it on YouTube, and I'm looking at it like, that's, that's the guy, that's the guy who made the rejuvenator right there. So at least now I know what he looks like, which is kind of awesome. But let's do that, because keep, keep in mind, it's 1990, we just exited the 80s. Yeah, right. this is the, uh the Vega 1000 rejuvenator card. Uh, basically, you replace your old right control score board, which contained your Kickstarter RAM, and it you replace it with a slightly larger card. It plugs into the Agnes Paul the D sockets, and it gives you the new custom chipset, including uh, the ability to use the ECS Denise. One mega chip RAM with future expansion to two mega if Commodore should ever start supplying the chips commercially. Uh, that was a dig. Fully compatible. You can flip back and forth between Kickstart or the ROM that's on here. If you well, it will support the 256 uh, 512K ROM. It's totally sweaty, and I know why. There's a video slot also? Yes. Uh, it has a real time clock and a uh, Flicker Pixel compatible uh, uh, video slot. There's also some uh, holes for you to adapt other Not even the to it, such as Genlox and Live. And most of the programs are compatible with what you have here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it works real well. <laughs> uh, it's close. Uh, 499 dollars Alright, $500. I don't know if anybody caught this. You guys see who's on his shirt? Does anybody know who this is? Those are various incarnations. Uh, Doctor Who. Thank you. Doctor Who in the house. Right? Alright. So I find this and I'm like, well the guy looks like he's 20. He's like mine. So I would have, I'm 46. I'm thinking, I would have been like the same age as this guy. Turns out that's not true. He's, um, I thought I looked young for my age, but tr truth is, he looks really young for his age. So anyway, I had this in my mind, okay, this guy's really, really young. Let me get back into play mode. Yeah. All right. No. All right. So then I started to scour that video the entire hour long, which I'm not going to put you guys through. It's, uh, I think for some folks, it'd be extremely painful to watch. For me personally, I, I loved every single second of it. It just felt, it was so nerdy and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But these people that they talked to, he actually knew a lot of the people in the video. And I was able to kind of go off of that a little bit. One of the guys in the video was named Ben Williams of Black Belt Systems. This guy was a really interesting character that Greg had done business with before. And Ben had actually, at least according to Greg, so much drama in the Amiga community, it's ridiculous. He felt like he'd been screwed over and da da da. But Ben had created some software, right, that allows you to design circuit boards for computers. And Greg actually used the software that Ben had created on his Amiga to design the board for his Amiga, the Rejuvenator. So they kind of had that relationship there that kind of grew for a little while before it went up in flames. Um, also, I began to contact folks from the Dayton, Ohio Amiga user group. And the reason why that's at least I think worthy of note, is because Eric Schwartz was a member of that user group, and so was Greg. Does anybody know who Eric Schwartz was? Right? Can you tell me what he did, or why he might be famous? He's a cartoonist. He's a cartoonist, yeah, he's a cartoonist that would create animated cartoons on his Amiga of, uh, let's say, furry animals that were very risque. Amy the squirrel. Yeah, the squirrel in particular. Amy, of course. Um, which some people almost consider like a mascot for Amiga. Uh, but it's not the kind of thing you would necessarily always show your kids. <laughs> but that's why Eric was famous. Um, and I actually reached out to him. And he actually wrote me back. So did Ben. Hadn't seen Greg in over 20 years. Sorry, I wish I could be of more help. Uh, nobody from the user group knew where he went. And I can explain why in just a little while, but he basically went pretty, he went dark in the Amiga community after about 1992. So I was starting to run out of ideas. I had gone to uh, the Kentucky uh, Kentucky um, uh, record keeping uh, agencies, the Ohio record keeping agencies. I actually did find expert services that way and some of their contact information. But Greg was through an LLC, and as a result. 
it's done at the county level, not done at the state, state level. So, so it's like, Lordy, Lordy, <laughs> break, 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 break. For me to even say 25 year old documents, they're not even, not even realistic. realistically. Could his phone be read the same? same? But I created a video, video uh, under the, the brand of Amigo Love, right? right. right. And, and, and I, 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 I explained this, this whole process, process of what, why the machine is, why the board is so cool to rejuvenate what I'd like, what I'd to, like do, to do, made my intentions known, and I put a plea out there, and I was like, like, if anybody out there, and I did this on Facebook and other places too, and I did find some of his friends, but I never found out. If anybody out there can tell me where I can contact Greg, I'd really love to talk to him about this idea of mine to bring this back. Please, just message me or something. Um, and this guy from Denmark commented on YouTube, and he said, you know, I just used his name, and uh, Dayton, Ohio, and a couple other keywords. And I get this, and I'm like, yeah, I saw that. It's a guy that's supposedly 58 years old in Dayton, Ohio. Now, to be fair, the last name of Tibbs is pretty unusual. There aren't a whole lot of Tibbs out there. Uh, and I kept running into two, Greg and this other guy, who I think might actually be his father. Um, but he's like, I, I do see this address, and I see this phone number there. I was like, I've already done the phone number thing so many times, I'm not gonna do that, uh, but I'll, whatever, I'll, this was my idea. I'll write down my entire attention here, explain who I am, put it in a sealed envelope, and this is what I figure is gonna happen. I'm gonna put it in the mail, and in about two weeks, I'm gonna get it back, return to sender, and I'll have it for court purposes, if I ever get sued, right, that I tried to tell them, and it, I couldn't find them, I tried. Um, Around the same time frame, I contacted a, a shop here in Seattle called TASC, T-A-S-C. They've been around since 91, and they're over kind of near Gasworks, um, to see if they would actually have the expertise and the knowledge to help me make one of these things, if we could actually create the plans, create the schematics, artwork, and all of that stuff. And so his first question, the guy that runs it, his name is Richard Hurst, really cool guy, uh, you know, long gray hair and a ponytail, Birkenstocks, and all of that. Uh, meet my two dogs, and he was like, is this going to be ethical? And I'm like, oh man, I've been trying this for so long. I hope so, yeah, but I don't even know if Greg is alive. Um, and he's like, yeah, no, I think we I think we can do this. It's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost some money. I'm like, yeah, no, I get that. Um, not for me personally. We're going to create a, a campaign around it. Uh, my wife is sitting right there. I don't want her to think that I'm paying for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> this is just research. Um, so anyway, we're starting to have these communications and we're starting to say, oh, it looks like this might be possible, but all I had at the time was this. I had, I had one rejuvenator and it was like, well, you know, we'd have to basically desolder the whole thing. We have to take all this stuff off so that we can analyze the board. I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know. I don't know if I ever see one of these again. Uh, and I don't know if what we're gonna do is gonna work. So I don't know if I want you to do that, Richard. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, why don't you see if you can figure out the company that printed that, and they might still have the files. So I'm, I'm contacting places in Canada, Richardson, Texas, other places in Ohio, uh, and right about that time, at the end of the week, when I talked to Richard, I'd already sent the letter, it was a Saturday, and I get a letter in the mail, or no, sorry, I get an email, an actual email. And it, uh, and it said, the, the, the subject line was rejuvenated. And the sender was Greg. And it was this really long email. Eric, I'm the guy you're looking for. I was like, it was like chariots of fire. And I was like, <laughs> and, and, and jealous in the background. It was ridiculous. I just was wiping away the tears. Like, oh my God, it's Greg. I found this guy's luck. He actually was 58 years old. He really does look like a baby in that photo, or in that video. Uh, and he goes on to tell me about all about the history of the time frame, the bugs that are in the board now, uh, and as they exist today. Um, and most importantly, right there towards the bottom, and if you want to build this thing, you totally have my blessing. Mm. Like, oh, wow. Oh, that's what I was totally looking for. Mm. So, Thank you, Greg. He's like, but. Mm. Technically, Expert Services owns it. I designed it. They screwed me over for $50,000 and I told them to, you know, 
and so we haven't been on speaking terms. He just left the Amiga community completely because he kept getting screwed over place after place after place. Total computer genius, and he just was done with it. All he got out of the deal, he was supposed to be receiving about fifty thousand dollars in total sales kickbacks to him. He got an Amiga three thousand. So, yeah. I'm not here to say who's right and who's wrong. That's not what this is about. And it just so happens that I tried really hard, and with the encouragement of friends, I continued to look for him. And that same, that next week, I did find Scott Bennett, one of the owners of Expert Services, uh, who was still alive and in Kentucky. Uh, you've already seen this. And. Um, and boy, I, would, I was like, everything's starting to fall into place. I found Scott, and I said, look, I, by the way, Greg was like, I have no I have no artwork. All of my discs from that time frame were corrupted. Uh, I threw everything away. I didn't want anything else to do with it. Um, please go forward and do whatever you want. I don't care. I'm into racing cars now. I'm not into mm. Oh, my gosh. Well, OK. At least I've got a little something there. With Scott, first off, he was completely stunned uh, by some of this history and the way that, um, that I related. He didn't see it the same way necessarily. He was a little saddened by that, to be honest, I think. Um, and I asked him, do you have any of the old discs and the old artwork for those uh, circuit boards? And he's like, you know, nine months ago, I gutted my warehouse. I got rid of everything. Nine months? Not nine months. <laughs> I was so close. I didn't have to wait so long. Um, he's like, but let me go look. And you know, each day goes by, and, uh, this can't be good. And then a couple days later, he said, Eric, look what I have. So, mm. This is a rejuvenator that is unpopulated, mm. right? It's exactly the same thing as this, but none of the chips are on it. I'm like, I don't have to take mine apart. Mm. <laughs> and I, I contacted Richard first, and I said, and I actually, it's hilarious, I held it up to my window with the sun coming through, so it looks all angelic. I'm like, Richard, <laughs> that's exactly what we need. I'm like, that's what I wanted you to say. Why oh, aren't you finished already? So he's going to be able to take this. I was like, you can't have it until I'm ready. I want to talk to some people about this for a time. So he's actually going to be able to analyze this. Now, I am not an engineer. I'm not and pretend to be, but this is what they would call a four-layer board, which is actually much more complicated than the way the rejuvenator had originally been created. Originally, it was what they would call two-layer, and according to Greg Tibbs, when it was two-layer, it worked perfectly. But he got some advice from a Commodore uh, developer who said, you should make that four-layer. Well, he's like, well, I guess I should. And so he did, and now it's buggy. But it still works well enough. And so we're going to continue to just recreate the one that actually went out to market. There it is. Look at that. That was the picture I was trying to clean your mind. Um, yeah, and he let me, he just shipped it to me for free. And I was like, you want it back? And he's like, I do want it back. Like, you got to be kidding me, man. You want this thing back? All right, fine. So I'll give it back to him someday. <coughs> so where do things stand right now? So according to the company that I've been talking to here in Seattle, uh, they uh, need what's called a bomb, which doesn't sound like something you'd want to put in your computer, no. um, but it's a uh, little material. Basically, you take the original board and you write down, well, in the computer, in a spreadsheet, every single chip, every single component, right, and all of the little markings on them, and you source them, figure out where they're going to be uh, found. So you can actually make them. And most of the chips on there are things you can still find to this day. There are a small handful that you can't, for instance. Uh, the chips that come out of your own machine, you have to supply those yourself, right? The, uh, the Agnes, the Paula, and the Denise. And then the, the RAM on here is a very antiquated type of DRAM, which they only made for a couple of years but we have found a supplier for that DRAM. Uh, once the bomb is finished in the next week or two, and all of those parts have been sourced, Richard at Task is then going to tell me how much he thinks it's going to cost, and we have to kind of talk you know, with the community, how many of these do we actually want to make? Because, for instance, you might need a particular type of resistor 
And you're like, well, we only need 20 of them. Well, they only sell them in batches of 1,000. Mm. So you've got to take all 1,000, even though you don't need but 20, pull out the 20 that you need, and you have to take that cost and spread it across the whole product, right? Things like that. Um, that's an exaggeration, but that's kind of how it works. And then once we kind of have a base idea as to how much these boards might cost, depending on how many we decide to build, <coughs> we'll be able to create, in the next couple of weeks, it's, it's literally going to be the end of June, uh, a GoFundMe campaign that will pay for all the stuff that will actually produce these boards. The idea being, the boards themselves, when they're made, are only going to cost however much it costs to make them. Zero profit involved. Unfortunately, they're still going to not be cheap. Um, you heard Greg say, oh, these are about $499 or whatever. Uh, they're probably going to be just south of that, realistically. Uh, probably in the $400 range from what the guesstimates are at this stage, but we'll know an exact figure uh, once we get to that point. And, and if the GoFundMe <coughs> is successful, the GoFundMe is there to help create the schematics, the board layout, it's not even for creating the boards themselves. It's just all of the designs that the engineers are going to need so that they can then print the boards and actually assemble them. And then we'll have one of two options. It'll either be, in order to lower cost, depending on what that final price is, uh, you can buy it as a kit if you're really industrious and just do it yourself. Here's all the stuff. You'll just get a bag of goodies <laughs> and you get a multi-weekend project of soldering and hope you don't screw it up. Um, that's where I would be, but I know I pull this up. Um, I'm not an expert solder. Or, Task will build them for us uh, and obviously just add the labor for that. And so, somewhere in the ballpark. And that's it. That's the rejuvenator. Yes? So, question. So, the original rejuvenator used an H372B. Agnes chip, those are very difficult to find these days. Huh. Um, the Amiga 600 Agnes chip, I think H375R1 or 2 chips, uh -huh. are much easier to find. They do have a slightly different pin out. Right. Any idea of moving over to that? It would also require for the general compatibility, you would need an external clock. Yes, but that's uh, a great question. The question is compatibility with the various Agnes chips, the one that came with it that what it was originally designed for, uh, or some others that are easier to acquire. Um, really good point. For, for version one, the idea is to just recreate what we have and see if we can make it work at all, right? Can we actually even do that? And build the 20 or 30 words, I'm not thinking we're gonna make hundreds, it's probably in that range, 20 to 30. Um, if we actually get it to work and can get rid of that product, the idea is to release the files to the public to do whatever they want. If you want to put in an A600 Agnes in there, if you have that talent and the skill, why not? Do whatever you And let the community continue to build upon this product further in an open source way and make it more and more robust. And then people can basically build whichever ones they want. That's what I would like to do. I don't want to own this beyond this first rev. I want to get it out there into everyone else's hands once it's paid for itself. Everybody's happy, hopefully. Now, to that point of being happy, I'm not happy. Because I have yet to get this darn thing to work because the daughter board is really easy to take on and off. You're not really supposed to do this, but it's really easy to do. Um, and they made it very easy to do with these, with these receptacles here, these orange things. It's very simple to pop them back on and off. Even with 46-year-old eyes, I can do it. With, uh, with the Rejuvenator, I think this might be one of those things that we tweaked a little for version 1. But basically, there's, you, can't, you can't even see them, but there's just holes on the back of this. And there's, there's literally probably somewhere in the ballpark of like 80 holes, maybe? Something like that. And you have to remove your daughter board, pull these things off of here that were on here to begin with, which I've removed, and pray you didn't bend these pins a tenth of a millimeter. And then magically put 
this perfectly uh, right on top of them mm -hmm. and seed it. And I've done this twice, and there's always one pin that goes, no. I'm like, oh my gosh. So this motherboard is still a perfectly working A1000, and I'm probably going to just say, you're a stock machine, Woo, back you go, and start with another one until I get it right. Um, Matt Martin here in the audience, who's actually become a fairly skilled uh, tinkerer of retro hardware and 3D printer of goodies, uh, is probably going to create some little guides, really small guides, that some of these rejuvenators came with back in the day, so that the pins wouldn't move before you pressed it down, and it was a perfect fit. So, anyway, a little sidetrack side there, but yeah, yeah. I absolutely would like for that to happen, if you were asking. It is, and in, in, in 1990 when they released it, they actually had these little spacer beads that would fit over those pins. And, uh, I don't have those. Yeah, it was really the only way to get the board on there successfully. Don't say that. I feel like you were over and over and over trying to get it. Yeah, lots of, lots of praying and cursing. <laughs> actually, I do have one more suggestion regarding that. Uh, one thing I've been doing on my machines is I don't like to mess up the original sockets that are on the machines. I can desolder them, and I don't want to. So what I typically do is just put a regular double leaf socket in, okay. because then I can replace that if something gets messed up. So it makes sense to make the poles shorter. Mm -hmm. So just put a 28 pin double leaf socket in, and you don't screw up the motherboard, and then it just pushes in there. So then it's like at first you have to fix the pins, and you have to just replace the socket. Yeah, definitely. So well, we should talk for this. <laughs> I would like that. Okay, well, cool. Well, that was basically <coughs> our first talk about the rejuvenator. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody else about that after this is over. I was going to do a second talk today, um, which will not take too long. I just need about five minutes to set up a couple of things. And basically, the idea of the second talk is how you launch, how you actually turn one of these things on, which is kind of funny if you've never seen this before. This completely floppy based disk, uh, floppy disk based. Um, but how over the years, some really talented programmers found ways to not only boot off of one disk instead of two, <coughs> but they found ways to boot into operating systems that make no sense. Mm -hmm. um, and turn the Omega 1000, which is was made for 1.3 and can be expanded into something that can literally run off of a floppy disk, not hardware, any kind of operating system Amiga ever created. So that's what the second talk will be, and it'll be about five minutes. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you come back or don't go away. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.